It was a Thursday night in Las Vegas. I had just booked a loss at the win and was looking to get it back at the Venetian. One thing I'd really been wanting to do before I left is meet up with popular vlogger Jeff Boski. Do you think the strippers want to be on camera? No. Jeff has been a supporter of my vlog more than any of the other vloggers, and I was looking forward to meeting him in person for the first time, so I invited him to meet me at the Venetian. Come to find out, it was his decision to invite a third player to that room that resulted in an unforgettable evening. The man Jeff invited is Michael Haig. I hadn't met him, but I quickly learned that he had a background in mixed martial arts. What is your background in MMA? Well, I trained jiu-jitsu for about two and a half years, three years, um, and then I did some Muay Thai, and then when I was younger I did Kung Fu and Karate and all that, but mainly I've been training jiu-jitsu. After a couple of hours of play, when Michael was walking out of the poker room, he saw a man and a woman get into a scuffle. What exactly happened when you were walking by and you saw uh, this one gentleman and uh, this girl next to him kind of get into an argument and you intervened? Uh, well, I got to take a break and I was walking out of the Venetian poker room. There was one empty table right before you walk out. And I seen the guy and the girl arguing a little bit. Oh, well, actually not a little bit, a lot. And she like smacked him in the shoulder or something like that. And he was sitting down. And when she smacked him in the shoulder, he jumped up and, and he just cold cocked her right in the face, square. Her head ripped back and all that. Right in front of me, I was shocked. And so then he grabs her and starts choking her with his hands. He's like, he's starting to say, like, I'll effing kill you. If you touch me, I'm going to effing kill you. And he's choking her. It was at that point when Michael realized that security was nowhere to be found. But that didn't bother him. He took action into his own hands something I was able to briefly capture on video. Oh, it's my buddy Mike. Stop, let go. Stop, you can hear the woman screaming for Michael to let go of her. The man who just punched her in the face. I wish I had been able to get better video, but another look in slow motion shows Michael's Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills in action. And I walked by and I locked eyes with him thinking he would stop and then we can get security or something. But there's nobody that was close in the area that could prevent it. And he didn't stop. He continued to choke her and she was gurgling and stuff. So I just decided in the spur of the moment to take the matters in my own hands. Uh, so I just jumped on him, did a standing rear naked choke on him. Uh, that way he would let go to her. And uh, I was hoping to just put him to sleep with no harm done to him at the same time. That way, that's the, the great thing about jiu-jitsu is you can still subdue your opponent without actually hurting them. So that was what I chose to do. I, I grabbed him rear naked uh, chokehold from standing. I held it on until he fell asleep and we hit the ground and he was out. And then at that point, I knew he was subdued enough to where he was no longer a threat. Despite being hit in the face by the man that Michael subdued, the woman would not stop screaming for Michael to let him go, something he did not do. As this is happening, the thing I noticed was this girl, who this guy had just cold cocked, as you described, she's screaming at you to let him go. So what is going through your head at that point? Yeah, at that point, I'm not really happy with the situation because now I have him in a rear naked choke and I have no way defending myself versus her if she happens to have a bottle in her hand. That's the dangerous part to it is that you have to account for that and thankfully a couple guys jumped up from the table, ran over and, and tried to help with the situation as much as they could because she was freaking out and yelling at me and, and grabbing at me and uh, I was a little bit defenseless um, so that's it, but it's, it's just a sad situation because you're like you just see this guy punch her in the face, he's choking her, saying he's going to kill her and she's defending him. I'm defending her, but she's defending him. Outside of a food comp at the Grand Lux Cafe, the Venetian didn't really reward Michael for his efforts. But perhaps you could argue that the poker gods did. As before the incident happened, he had just made a queen high straight flush. And the Venetian instituted a high hand of the hour cash giveaway. Let's get to the best part of the story, <laughs> was you were in a 2-5 game at the time, just like <laughs> Jeff and I were. Yeah. They have a promotion here at the Venetian that gives away a $1,000 bonus every hour for the highest hand of the hour, and with 30-something tables or so in the room, 
you got to have a pretty big hand. You make a queen high straight flush. Before this happens, the security takes you back. This all goes down. You come back from this whole chaos and, and win the high hand. Yeah. This is amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty insane. What a good night. I almost stayed home tonight, but thanks to my buddy Jeff Boski for telling me to come out and play Venetian. It all worked yeah. out well. Thanks, buddy. All right, so I'm here with Jeff and Mike. We are grabbing some midnight eats. Pretty rare for me to grab a, a meal at uh, just before 1 a.m. That's what we're doing right now, and I'm told the jambalaya, we're here in Grand Lux Cafe at the Venetian. I'm told this jambalaya with chicken is uh, something I gotta try. So I'm taking Jeff's recommendation on that. We'll see how it is. Jeff also featured the fight on his vlog, and shortly after, it was picked up by Poker News. Even a two plus two thread started on the topic. All right, so I'm here with Mr. Boski. We are, uh, what time is it now? It is 2.08 in the morning. That's about as late as I've been out in quite some time. When I worked on the morning show, this is roughly about the time I'd be getting up, Ooh. Uh, going into work. Ooh. So uh, I've kind of flipped the script there ever since I got rid of the morning show hours. But uh, for those who have not seen your vlog, how would you describe the style of your vlog uh, in, uh, in terms of overall how it fits into the, uh, the landscape of poker vlogs? I'm one of the original poker vloggers and to my knowledge, the only tournament poker vlogger. Uh, it's a raw look, no faking it. No happy smiles, no I lost two grand, life is good, let's get some cocktails type of humor. This is real. I lose tournaments 95% of the time and you're gonna see my raw emotion every time I lose. I'm gonna give you real hand histories, not nitpicking. I show every single live tournament I've ever played in the last two years so you get a real sample size of what it's like to be a tournament pro. Any spots around town? That, uh, that you really recommend? Like, we're, like what's, what's, uh, what kind of stuff you like uh, checking out doing in the free time when you're not playing poker around Las Vegas? I go to dog parks. I, I'm in a couple bowling leagues. Um, I, you know, I get a lot of hate for doing the strip club reviews, the buffet reviews, the poker room reviews, but these aren't easily done. You try to do, you try to get a camera and interview strippers at a strip club. You think camera, you think strippers want to be on camera? No, good luck. So appreciate the footage I put out there. Uh, check out Sophia's Gentleman's Club. Use bonus code BOSKI for the first drink on the house. Free limo, a free entrance. All you gotta say is my name. You're welcome. Now you, you, you've you started a, uh, a great running gag on, on your vlog, which I think is fantastic, where you're running down a hand history and there's someone else that's just standing next to you not saying or doing anything. Uh, now, I had the pleasure of being this guy in a recent vlog, so how did that come about for you, doing that into your vlogs? Uh, it was very organic, un unplanned. Um, I was on break during one of the first World Series events this last year, and I was talking to Brad Owen. I was like, oh shit, I gotta go over this hand real quick. I was like, hey, you're sitting next to me. He goes, I'm not saying shit. I'm like, I don't care, I don't want you to say shit. And he just stared at the camera. One thing led to another. A lot of like random vlog watchers ended up, uh, you know, seeing me in the hallway uh, on the breaks, and they said, "Hey, I want to be that guy." I said, "Sure, no problem. You know what to do. Don't do shit. Don't do nothing. Just sit there and stare at the camera." And the comments are gold. It mystifies people. They wonder, "Who is this person? And why are they not moving? Why are they mannequins?" Uh, they officially got called stand-ins on the two plus two forums. And uh, people loved it, so I continued to do it. And it wasn't hard getting uh, people to do it. Poker Crowd's been featured, and a few others I forget because the summer is just nonstop poker and vlogs. Uh, so there you have it, the, the stand-in bit. It's a great bit. Go back through, you can check out some of Jeff's old vlogs. I just saw one today at the World Series of Poker. He had, had one guy, he just crushed it in that role there. He's fantastic, so if you want a good laugh, that's a good way to go. And uh, check out his YouTube channel. Doing quite well, blowing up reviews of different casinos I really like, and of course the general vlogs that you'll see on there with Mr. Jeff Boskin.
I'm willing to bet this is the first poker hand that's ever been discussed at the Ward Charcoal Ovens State Historic Park just outside of Ely, Nevada. This actually happened last night. I'm recording this on a Friday, and it was Thursday night at the Venetian where I met up with Jeff Boski, and uh, we played together for a while. Um, and I actually had to cut the session short, but there was one interesting hand that had, did happen. Primarily, all the hands I won were very small pots in this game, but it was a pretty good game at the Venetian. As I've been saying, the games at the Venetian, to me, have been better than the games at the win. Um, but that could be fluky uh, and just short-term luck in regards to game selection. But the hand actually happened when MP1 open limps and MP2 raises it to 15. I am on the button with ace 10 of hearts and I make the call. Flop comes king of spades, jack of spades, three of hearts. MP1 donk leads into this pot for $40. MP2 thinks about it for a minute and he just calls. Part of me thought he might raise all in. He only had about uh, 250, 260 or so left. But he just calls and it's back over to me. And with the nut, uh, the nut straight draw, the gut shot straight draw, and a backdoor nut flush draw, I make the call as well. Hoping for a heart on the turn. I don't get one. It comes a deuce of diamonds. But uh, now the MP1, who donk led that flop, checks. And MP2 checks. And I think it seems pretty optimistic of me to think that I'm going to get two folds here, especially when a large portion of the range of hands that this guy is leading out with include fl flush draws that he's now pot controlling and is going to check call and he bet with. He has me covered, by the way. The other guy's pretty short stacked, and I don't really know what he has. Part of me thought he may have been holding on with a hand like pocket queens, but I wasn't quite sure. And to try to get them both out here, I just didn't like the idea of doing. Maybe I should have tried, but I decided to check it back. And the river pairs the king. So both of my draws miss, and uh, the board now pairs on the air. And I'm certainly expecting that if either one of these guys bets, they're going to have a king. Fortunately for me, nobody bets. So I can pretty well now put the guy in MP1 on a flush draw that missed. I'm still not sure about MP2. But uh, now I think I have a spot where I can definitely consider a bluff. If I'm up against a flush draw, there's, an, uh, there's a pretty good chance I have the best hand anyway. But uh, if I am up against an underpair, which I think I am in particularly the spot of MP2, I need to bet to try to get him off of it. As I mentioned, he's already pretty short stacked. He's got under $300 left, so if I uh, make him risk a ton of that to win this hand, I don't think he's going to want to do that. So I go ahead and bet $110, uh, and the first guy thinks about it for a little while. Do maybe 10 seconds at most, and then he folds. I think he actually did have a flush draw. Maybe the A-side flush draw was considering calling with that. And uh, MP2 folds as well pretty quickly. So the bluff gets through and I take that one down. All in all, it was basically a break-even trip to Vegas in terms of the poker. I had that small win at the Venetian the first night, about a $525 loss at the win the next day, and then a little over a $300 win in that game at the Venetian that next night. So roughly break-even. Did see a Golden Knights win, which is cool, but primarily it was a work trip, and uh, every Silver State side segment that I shot went extremely well and uh, a little bit of action at the poker room too.